everybody. This is Andy with the Coffee with the Geek program. It is August of 2019. We're getting close to back to school here in Western New York. With me is a really tech savvy and innovative teacher, Kirsten Lewis. She is from Pine Valley Central Schools, the elementary school there. She teaches third grade and she has a passion for books and reading with a splash of tech integration. She's a 15 year teaching veteran. Hard to believe that, Kirsten. Uh, she holds a master's degree in literacy with certifications in elementary education, English, and literacy. And she is a self-proclaimed introvert for a weakness with coffee. So we'll start with that, uh, Kirsten. So tell us your favorite blend of coffee. My favorite is um, Equal Exchange, and we usually buy the Mind, Body, and Soul blend. Um, I'm picky about, I like to buy the whole beans and grind them as we make the coffee rather than having them ground. It makes such a better cup of coffee. Nice. And you're a big fan of um, a coffee place in Buffalo, are you not? We or usually Lackawanna? go to Lexington Co-op and I buy the beans in bulk. So they're organic, fair trade, all of that fun <laughs> stuff. <laughs> nice, nice. All right. So... Um, Kirsten, I've had a really, it's been a pleasure working with you over this year as a tech integrator at Pine Valley, and there's some really great uh, tech savvy teachers. Can you maybe talk about, um, I guess, Pine Valley in general, but then just talk about your journey as a tech savvy teacher in, uh, in a district with some really good tech savvy teachers? Yeah, so when I first started teaching, um, the extent of our technology was basically a TV on a cart. Um, and four clunky desktops. That's all I had when I first started. Um, in 2012, we went to iPads, one-to-one -one devices. Uh, the big thing then was QR codes. So we were making these cute little worksheets and um, students were, cre were uh, solving their math problems and then checking their answers with QR codes. Um, we kind of moved into fun apps like Sock Puppets and Book Creator when it was um, just app-based. And then last year, we moved to one-to-one -one laptops in um, third grade and above. That's where we really got the chance to dig deeper into technology. Um, so my favorites this year, we did some work with green screen, which was iPad-based. Um, we worked with Book Creator. We did a lot with Microsoft Office Suite. Lots of good stuff. So when you, how long have you had the laptops for one-to-one -one with your students? That was, we just started in the fall of last year, so fall of 2018. And what are your just general thoughts of Office 365? How do third graders handle, you know, the Office 365? And I know you've used OneNote with your students, um, PowerPoint with your students. Tell me about maybe the Office connection there. So what we use the majority um, of our time with for Microsoft is um, OneNote. And I use that in our um, reading workshop and our writing workshop um, for social studies as well. Um, so for example, for writing, um, I created a OneNote and all the students were connected in the content library. I was able to do kind of like a, an anchor chart of sorts. So students could go back to that. The content library for anybody who's not a Microsoft user um, gives a uh, anybody who's participating, the ability to see something, but they don't have the ability to edit. Um, and then in real time, I could uh, write with the students. So they would have an, an example of what we were working on. Say we were working on um, providing a hook for your writing. So we would play through some different hooks and I would show them that on the screen, but it was available for them to look back at. Um, and what I liked about OneNote is each student has their own tab. Um, and in, they can't see each other's work, but I can see all of theirs. So it's really quick for me to look to see what kind of progress they're making um, and within their own tab. Um, students also created their own pages within their tab for what we were working on. So if we were working on Hook that week, they had a tab for Hook. So with all their different ideas that they used for um, their hooks, and then they would choose one to kind of elaborate on to build that final writing piece on another page. So... As a teacher with 15 years of teaching experience under your belt, and so I'm sure you've gone through a variety of technologies, but you've also probably done some traditional teaching of just books, pencils, and papers. How do you kind of compare the traditional approaches with, with the newer kind of, for lack of a better term, 21st century approaches with your work? Um, with third grade, I found it difficult just because they're not, they don't have the typing speed 
needed to keep going. Um, but we're working on it. We get more with pencil and paper. Um, but I love the uh, flexibility with working with things virtually or on their laptops, as opposed to keeping all keeping track of all of these notebooks and loose papers. Um, so that's where OneNote was really handy last year. Um, the year before, before we had the one-to-one -one devices, we would have papers everywhere. You know, writing pieces were lost, and it's really great to have everything in one place. Kind of, let's look at your crystal ball for a moment. Where do you see technology taking us in, you know, or, or even you for that matter in five, 10, 15 years? What's your, where are you seeing technology going and, and where would you like it to go, I guess? Um, there's a lot of push toward e-learning. Um, and we had a presenter a few years ago at Pine Valley who talked about um, how much students learn in direct instruction from a teacher versus on an online learning platform, um, maybe like in a game situation, looking at gamification. Um, so that really looks like it's the trend um, in, in students being able to learn more at a faster pace in a flexible environment and really at a student pace level as well. Um, I think that we're going to see a lot more of that. Um, and I wonder if schools in the traditional sense are going to be changed with that e-learning. So let's expand on that. How do you see them changing? Are you talking about the physical changes or are you talking about organizational changes or both? Um, I'm thinking about both. Um, I'm wondering about e-learning having the possibility of phasing teacher, the need for physical teachers in the classroom, phasing that out. Um, but there's one piece that we don't have that social aspect. There's not that community that that teachers need to be there for. How do you, let's talk about maybe your PLNs, your professional learning networks. Um, what are some of the, you know, uh, social media trends you keep track of? Where are places that you can uh, get some new ideas and, and what are some of your sources that you, you look at? Um, Twitter, for sure. Um, I get a lot of ideas for the green screen, um, a lot of ideas for Flipgrid and Book Creator. Um, I love Instagram as well with the visuals. It's really great to see what people are doing um, visually. Um, I have to say Instagram is more of the um, concrete, um, hands-on type activities that I get, but in terms of ed tech, um, Twitter is where I get really most of my ideas. All right, now this is the question I've been waiting to ask. So, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of Black Mirror and um, I don't know if you could say a fan because it, it leaves you uh, a little <laughs> a little overwhelmed sometimes. But, uh, you know, Black Mirror, you're now part of our Black Mirror support group. Um, talk about Black Mirror or an episode of Black Mirror or something that's really uh, impacted you Black Mirror and also maybe tie in some education to it, so. So I was thinking about this a lot. Um, my husband, Ben, and I were going back and forth. I took some notes on the, the episode that I was thinking about. Um, not necessarily my favorite episode, but when I'm trying to tie it to education, I was thinking about the episode called Archangel. Um, and that's the one with the mother um, wants to keep track of her daughter. So she has this, um, it's a type of biometric device. Um, implanted in her daughter and it gives her the ability to keep track of her daughter's um, health, her um, emotional um, status, and she can actually um, interact and block things. Like in the episode, um, there's a scene where the daughter has the ability to, I think she's going to see blood and the, the mother's able to block it out. Um, but she finds that it's having a negative effect. She's interacting too much or kind of um, stopping things and the child's not developing as needed. Um, but I was thinking about that in terms of education and how much time we spend um, learning students, learning what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, um, and we tailor our instruction to that. Um, if in the future we had something like Archangel, we would be able to figure out what students needed at a faster pace. But on the flip side of that, the negative part, um, we learn about students through talking and interaction, and that's that building that sense of community. So kind of like where there's always that black mirror leaves you hanging, leaves you kind of with an overwhelming sense of ickiness sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that's what I see with if we had an archangel in education, there would be good pieces, but also some bad pieces. Yeah, it could get overwhelming fast. Um, so just in general, 
maybe just talking about the show, what is, what is your sense about education and technology? I mean, related to maybe some of the dark side. I, I was reading an article. I think Charlie Brooker is the is the the creator of Black Mirror, and he said he's a big fan of technology. He's just kind of taking a piece of it, kind of pulling apart the the darkest aspect of it. I mean, and not all the not all the the videos are necessarily dark. Some have some positive spins to them as well. Um, but how do we how do we balance? I guess maybe looking at the show, how do you balance the dark side of technology with the positives in a school setting? It's a big uh, question. Balance the positive with the negatives. You're going off script here, Andre. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know there are so many positives in terms of putting student voice out there and connecting with others. I mean, around the world, it's made the world so much smaller. Um, uh, the negative side. That's a hard one. It's, I guess it's um, the idea of you are the, the people that you surround yourself with. Um, so knowing where to reach out and what places are safe. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. And I think um, I've always said, you know, knowledge reduces risk, you know, so the more you know about these technologies, um, the better it is. So I think that plays into it. And I think often our fear kind of, um, holds us back as educators from talking about technology or, or powerful ways to use it when really we should probably be doing the opposite, which is really informing our kids and talking to them about Instagram and, um, you know, again, um, you know, social networks sometimes get overwhelming, but I think it's important for teachers and parents as well to just have a general understanding of these so you can talk to your, your kids about them to keep them safe. Absolutely. There's a lot of it that goes um, goes along with the social aspect of um, uh, um, how you see yourself and not viewing yourself based on somebody else's stage show. Um, and we don't talk a lot about that. And I think that it might be tough for especially kids coming of age, a teenager, you're still trying to find yourself and you're seeing all of these great things on social media. And it makes it look like um, other people are living this grand life, but really they're just showing you the best of. Um, and we don't talk about that. I think that's important for it's important for adults as well. Yeah, and I think as kids, you know, if you think back to you know our days in school, we certainly had social interactions, and your kind of status within a social surrounding was certainly important to you, and probably hyper important in some cases. And now with technology, it's expanding it out to the nth degree, and um, you know, that adds a whole nother element of growing up in, in this age. So again, I think that's an area where we as parents and teachers really need to start talking to our kids about it and, and hopefully listening to them as well as to what their experiences are and not being so judgmental about these technologies. Um, so thoughts on that? Um, agreed. We, we need to set expectations and, um, not assume that just having a social media platform or any kind of platform to connect with others that means that you understand how to use it. Well, what I've loved about like when we've worked together, basically most of the times I'll just suggest something to you and you've either already put it into place or you just take off with it. Where do you get your kind of passion for, for technology and your kind of fearlessness and embracing something new, especially with third graders, which can be, you know, uh, uh, a unique age level they are they're a great age level um they're they're independent enough that i can give them something to do but they're still innocent and excited about everything which gets me excited to try something new um a lot of times when we try something new it's um, we use the sandbox approach i have them play with it because what better way to learn something than to play with it um, and it kind of gets that, um, the inquisitiveness out, you know, you get kids off task and doing other things and we kind of work those kinks out in the beginning. So we're not mm -hmm. off task when we want to actually create a project. Um, but in terms of starting something new, I always, I tell administration, I'm one of those people who wants something done yesterday. I'm not afraid to just jump and try something new. And that's really what keeps me afloat as a teacher. Um, I find that if I get stagnant and I'm not moving forward, that's kind of when I start to get bored with things and I'm not as excited to go to work. Um, so with third graders, like their just their excitement for things is really what drives my passion. 
I really like what you said there, and it's something I haven't heard before, which is kind of giving that sandbox time, letting kids kind of test drive a technology. Uh, and I think that's a really great idea, especially, I mean, it certainly could carry itself right up to high school, but just giving them time to tinker with it. And again, because students are so fearless, it gives them a chance to kind of tinker with something with there's no holds barred kind of, um, you know, opening to it. And you kind of get the, maybe the silliness or the, um, or even the fear in some cases for some kids that may be, um, you know, not so tech savvy or, or interested in tech, but it's, it's a really, I think, great idea. We learn a lot more too when we play. Um, when we first started using co-spaces, I didn't know everything. I knew the very basics of it, um, but we probably played for 45 minutes to an hour um, in the class with it, you know, figuring things out. We would stop every 15 minutes or so and regroup and say, who found something new? And somebody would showcase. And it's it's a way they're proud as well, third graders, to share with some with the group something that they figured out. Um, over the summer, we had, you brought a merge queue back from ISTE. We were playing with that in, a, in one of our summer enrichment courses. Um, and I gave, at first I gave my group a specific task. I did not give them time to play. The last day we had some visiting teachers, so we didn't have a lot of time and I just gave them time to play. And one of my kiddos said to me, this was so much more fun than when you told me what to do. I, <laughs> I said, like it's so much better when I can put whatever I want in here, you know, army men and unicorns and, right. and rainbows, everything at once. Right, well, that's awesome that you can embrace that. So speaking of that, what are some of your things you're gonna dig into this year at TechWise? My first thing is the Flipgrid AR feature. I saw that on um, Twitter. I think it was like the very beginning of the summer. So kids were already out for the summer. Um, usually in the beginning of the year, we talk goals. So I have my students make a general goal for the whole school year. We take a cute picture of them and um, they have a little statement underneath with an inspirational quote and we hang those in the hallway for open house for parents to see. Um, so my goal is for their goals um, to have a little QR code where we can have them explain a little more on Flipgrid and take advantage of that AR feature. So really excited to put that in place. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, it is time now for the Speed Geek questions. Are you ready? These I'm ready. Are quite challenging, but we'll. Uh, so I'm going to spin the dial here. So give me just a second to get this set up. I can find the window I put it in. That's my, that's my <laughs> too many windows. Okay, here we go. Okay, what's your favorite app? Instagram. All right, how come? <laughs> um, I actually have three Instagram accounts. One is my personal, um, one is my teaching. Um, and then I have another one for um, my maker friends. Um, I'm a knitter and a sewer, um, and I love baking. So that's kind of like my, uh, where I feel free to showcase things that I'm working on. Um, when I was crafting, if I would knit or sew something and I had to try it on and like take pictures and share it with the world, if I knew that I was sharing with, you know, high school friends that I connect with on Instagram, I found that I was much more shy. But if I have friends in the community who are doing the same thing as me, it's, it's a little more exciting to share with somebody who understands. Nice. So I love Instagram. It's my go-to. All right. Okay. Next up. Oh, this is the toughest one of all. Your favorite educational blog. Oh, it's a tie between. I love Truth for Teachers by Angela Watson. Um, and I also love Cult of Pedagogy <laughs> by um, Jennifer Gonzalez. And I listen to both podcasts too on the way to work. <laughs> Awesome. Good listening. Good listening for sure. And good reading. Both of those are really a wealth of information for sure. All right. And our last one. Oh, we did that one. Came up with a same one. It said favorite app. Usually it takes it okay. away. So let's just see. Uh, oh, this is one right up your alley. What is your whimsy? Star Wars, Star Trek, Harry Potter, um, if I have to talk about geeking out, it's genealogy. Really? I love researching genealogy. Yep. Um, so when I was 16, I, my grandfather used to go, he's no longer here, but um, he used to go to um, a group that was descendants of the 154th Regiment of the Civil War. So my great, great, great grandfather um, was a volunteer in this regiment. 
And I went with my grandfather and his cousins um, to this group, and I was kind of hooked on family history. Um, he gave me, my grandfather gave me a family tree and some old family photos, and I was off. Now I've added my husband's family, and we have 15,000 people on this family tree that goes so far back, I don't even know how legitimate it is anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but that's my fun time. That's um, I could be up until 2 o'clock in the morning researching DNA. Wow. <laughs> So that's kind of your way to unplug, well, kind of unplug as well, so. It's kind of dangerous because all of a sudden, you know, I don't know what time it is. And how is it three o'clock? I didn't even know. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating stuff, especially, you know, Western New York history. There's a lot of good stuff there. Yeah. All right, well, uh, Kirsten, keep up the great work. I love working with you and I'll work with you again and can't wait to see what your, your new projects are gonna be. Yeah, thanks, Andy. <laughs>